Relics of ancient man come to light slowly. Nevertheless, scientists just discovered new evidence of the mysterious Denisovans in Australia. Given the fact that recent DNA studies show that Papuan Highlanders interbred with a Denisovan-related group possibly as recently as 15,000 years ago, we should be looking for skulls with so-called archaic-looking features in Papua and Australia. However, this archaic population is deeply divergent from the northern Denisovans population from Siberia and China. Scientists identified another Denisovan population which lived in Southeast Asia that diverged around 363,000 years ago from the Siberian group. The Denisovan lineage found in Australia and New Guinea split off from the northern Denisovans around 283,000 years ago, suggesting they arrived in Australia New Guinea in around 300,000 years. This would have given them ample time to spread throughout the landmass known as Sahul, which is the connected lands of New Guinea, Australian and Tasmania during Ice Age sea levels. This also means that this so-called Denisovan lineage is as different from northern Denisovans as Neanderthals are from Homo sapiens. Therefore, the northern Denisovan skulls, such as from China, are not a good indicator of the skull morphology of this population. Until the Denisova genome was found, many paleoanthropologists assumed that South and East Asian populations of the early late Pleistocene were relict populations of Homo erectus, representing a relatively static population history from the initial human habitation of Asia. The Denisova genome appears inconsistent with that static model, according to a recent study titled How Australia Informs the Worldwide Pattern of Pleistocene Human Evolution. The peer-reviewed study was authored by leading anthropologists from the University of Michigan and the University of California. There are no diagnostic skeletal remains of Denisovans to help with this, and only limited inference is possible from the Denisovan range. But if we begin with the assessment that the sum of the ancestry of Australians is from populations inhabiting regions closest to Australia, one of the key conclusions of this research, and are mindful that the Denisovan haplotypes are unlikely to be from East Asians or Southeast Asian populations as they are constituted today, the other potential nearby source of Denisovan haplotypes would be from the Nyandong specimens from Java. We have no Nyandong DNA, but in view of the anatomical comparisons presented here and the geography of the region, where else could the significant Denisovan contribution have come from? According to the report, WLH-50 is the 29,000-year-old fossil of a large young to middle-aged male found in dune deposits near Lake Gampong, one of the Willandra Lakes in New South Wales, Australia. Its importance stems from the significant similarities it appears to have with the nearby and most probably earlier human sample from Gandong in Java, Indonesia. Two implications of these similarities are important the implications for human ancestry, and the implications for the place of Nyandong in human evolution. Embedded in the bank of the Solo River, in the shadow of the volcanoes of Sangiran, Solo Man remains apart. Volcanism deeply affected life, death, and fossilization of Homo erectus in eastern Java, where the volcanic province has produced 100 hominin fossils, reclassified from evolved Homo erectus to archaic Homo sapiens, for a long time Ngandong Man did not find a real place in taxonomy and in the scientific debate, whereas Neanderthal is still famous for its cultural or biological struggle against the ancestors of modern humans. Experts claim that there was no overlap of Homo erectus with Homo sapiens in Javi and that Homo sapiens arrived much later. But many researchers are not convinced, because Homo erectus fossil material from other Javanese sites has yet to be properly dated, and maybe even more recent. The Ngandong man remains are characterized by more derived traits than more archaic Javan Homo erectus, most notably a larger brain size, an elevated cranial vault, reduced post-orbital constriction, and less developed brow ridges, but the forehead is proportionally low and also has a low angle of inclination. The new study provides both a systematic and comprehensive description of the WLH-50 fossil in a comparative context 
and an interpretation of its place in human evolution. A comparative analysis of the WLH-50 cranium is important for understanding its morphological pattern and addressing its ancestry. In particular, whether there are multiple ancestors for WLH-50 and other Australians that include late Pleistocene Indonesians from Ngandong. Besides these anatomical considerations, the issues also are framed by genetic analysis, including both paleogenetics and observations of mitochondrial and nuclear DNA from modern populations, and we discuss their implications as well. Investigators concluded that WLH-50 is a normal specimen without evidence of pathology or deformation, and that elements of its anatomy are found throughout the Australian fossil record, as it is known today. The comparisons reveal WLH-50Cs has substantial similarities to the Ngandong hominids, but not identity with them, and a demonstrable pattern of multiple ancestors that includes Ngandong as part of the network of human evolution in Australasia. WLH-50 is much more robust and archaic than any Australian hominid found previously. In fact, it makes the cow swamp remains look gracile by comparison. This new specimen greatly reinforces the regional continuity linking Indonesia and Australia. The morphological sequence found in Australia shows clearly that regional features must be separated from grade features seen worldwide in order to understand the differing patterns of late Pleistocene human evolutionary change. It has been said that WLH-50 has many of the same features as Homo erectus, but some of WLH-50's most notable characteristics include a thick brow ridge, unusually thick and dense cranial vault, a large cranial capacity of 50-90 cubic centimetres, an extended neck area for muscle attachment, occipital bun and robust size. According to the recent African origin theory, the archaic humans from Indonesia are classified as Homo erectus, a different evolutionary species that could not have contributed to the ancestry of modern Australasians. Therefore, this theory of complete replacement makes clear predictions concerning the ancestry of the specimen WLH-50. The fossil is potentially only 14,000 years old, according to gamma spectroscopy and thermal ionization mass spectrometry uranium series dating. It has been suggested that the latter technique provides a minimum age for this fossil, due to the fact that uranium uptake begins following burial. Meanwhile, ESR dating techniques calculated that the bone fragment was 29,000 plus or minus 5,000 years old. However, even under the most generous interpretations of lineage divergence, different putative ancestors of WLH-50 have not been separated for long enough for significant reproductive isolation to be expected. This assessment is also supported by the analysis of nuclear DNA and by observed mixtures of both Neanderthal and Denisovan nuclear DNA with each other and in many human populations. Meanwhile, the pattern of variation outside Africa appears to reflect interbreeding among populations that were much more separate during the period before 100,000 years ago, including the Neanderthals and Denisovans. This historical pattern is not uncommon among mammals, for which reproductive incompatibility has rarely evolved in a period shorter than one million years. The recurrence of this pattern within and outside Africa and the geographic specificity of Denisovan and Neanderthal descendants. Both show that interbreeding among these ancient people recurred within their habitats. Neanderthals and Denisovans were part of the biological species Homo sapiens. Therefore, today's people around the world are a relict mixture of populations from an ancient species much more genetically and morphologically diverse than now accepting that Neanderthals and Denisovans are sister groups within the species Homo sapiens, there remains a fundamental difference between them. As far as the fossil record is concerned, we cannot identify who the Denisovans are, while there are almost certainly Denisovan fossils in the hands of paleoanthropologists today, we cannot recognize them, and it is even possible 
that there never was a recognizable sample of Denisovans in the sense that there is a recognizable sample of European Neanderthals. Surprisingly, the Denisovan contribution to the nuclear DNA of populations from New Guinea and Australia is some 25 times greater than the aforementioned contributions to mainland Asia and the Americas. The highest frequencies of Denisovan nuclear DNA in living populations are found in indigenous Australians and similar or slightly less in New Guineans. More broadly, current populations with significant amounts of Denisovan DNA are only found east of Wallace's line. However, speculation surrounds the exact age of this fossil hominid and a debate concerning its ancestry in relation to other late Pleistocene hominids, as well as Ngandong hominids, due to their close resemblance to one another. An ongoing debate within paleoanthropology is whether to place Ngandong hominids as Homo sapiens or Denisovans. Evaluating this ancestry is important to our understanding of modern human origins in Australasia because the prevailing models of human origins make different predictions for the ancestry of this specimen and others like it. The out-of-Africa theory, also known as the replacement theory, predicts that late Pleistocene Africans are direct ancestors of WHL-50 and that the Ngandong hominids are not direct ancestors of Australians. With the discovery of the so-called Denisovans, many now believe that these Nyandong hominids could be Southern Denisovans. Given that this group of Denisovans does not have a name, we propose the name Sahul hominins. In fact, evidence of a Southeast Asian location for the Denisovan admixture thus suggests that Denisovans were spread across a wider ecological and geographic region from the deciduous forests of Siberia to the tropics than any other hominin with the exception of modern humans. Researchers therefore contend that Ngandong hominids should be classified within the evolutionary species Homo sapiens. The multi-regional model of human evolution has the expectation that Australasian ancestry is in all three of the potentially ancestral groups and best explains modern Australasian origins. An analysis of data for three samples that are potential ancestors of WLH-50, including Ngandong hominids, late Pleistocene Africans, Levant hominids from Skul and Kafsi. An analysis of data for individuals within these samples indicate that the Ngandong hominids, or a population like them, may have contributed significantly to the ancestry of WLH-50. The Skul and Kafsi hominins, or Kafsi Skul, Early modern humans are hominin fossils discovered in school and Kafsi caves in the Levant. They are today classified as Homo sapiens, among the earliest of their species in Eurasia. The remains exhibit a mix of traits found in archaic and anatomically modern humans. They have been tentatively dated at about 80,120,000 years old. A more recent hypothesis is that school Kafsi hominids represent the first exodus of modern humans from Africa around 125,000 years ago, probably via the Sinai Peninsula, and that the robust features exhibited by the school Kafze hominids represent archaic sapiens features. The Ngandong hominins' last appearance coincides with a time when the world shifted from a glacial period to an interglacial period and temperatures rose. Java, which is now mostly rainforest, was covered in woodlands during this cold spell. The coldest and driest conditions most likely occurred around 135,000 years ago, exposing the Sunda Shelf and connecting the major Indonesian islands to the continent. By 125,000 years ago, the environment had become substantially warmer and wetter, transforming Java into an island and allowing tropical rainforests to expand. Judging by the sheer number of specimens deposited at Ngandong at the same time, there may have been a sizable population of Ngandong man before the volcanic eruption which resulted in their internment, but population is difficult to approximate with certainty. The Ngandong site was some distance away from the northern coast of the island, but it is unclear where the southern shoreline and the mouth of the Solo River would have been. Cannibalism and ritual headhunting have also been proposed based on the conspicuous lack of any remains other than the skullcap. 
This had been reinforced by the historic practice of headhunting and cannibalism in some recent Indonesian, Australian and Polynesian groups, which at the time were believed to have descended from these Homo erectus populations. Perhaps the Nyandong horde was taken by surprise and fled. Perhaps the skulls were put down to mark off the area. It seems that even today various tribes in New Guinea demarcate their dwelling or hunting grounds in a similar manner. They evidently suppose that the spirit dwelling in the skull can help them to defend a particular area against invaders, and with that tantalizing statement we leave you to ponder the mysteries of our human history. Until next time, stay curious and stay questioning. Thank you.